Good morning, everybody. My name is Fabian Levy, and I serve as Deputy Mayor for Communications for the City of New York. We appreciate you all joining us for our weekly in-person media availability. New Yorkers deserve safe streets, good-paying jobs, and a more affordable and livable city. With last week's budget agreement, we delivered on all those things. Our budget will invest in early childhood education and cultural institutions, libraries, and public schools, upstream and downstream approaches to public safety, help build more affordable housing that New Yorkers need, and so much more. And that's why the overwhelming number of city council members voted on it this past weekend. <laughs> and now that we're in a new fiscal year, we're starting over, which leads perfectly into segueing to the newest arrival to, the, uh, to Team Adams. Yesterday, Deputy Press Secretary Kayla Mamalek started the fiscal year by giving birth to Abel Mac Altus, weighing at seven pounds, one ounce, and measuring 19.75 inches, a future NBA star. Uh, many of you know that Kayla usually takes a leading role in helping to run these me media availabilities, uh, as well as our office, so we're going to miss her over the next three months. Thanks, Mayor, for doubling the amount of paid parental leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so mazel tov <laughs> to Kayla, to Adam, Big Sister Ivy, and Abel. Uh, now to get back to our regular scheduled programming, uh, to tell you more about the budget and all the work we're doing every day to get uh, stuff done for New Yorkers, the Mayor has once again convened senior leadership here at City Hall to answer your questions. So joining us today, we have Mayor Eric Adams, First Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright, Chief Advisor to the Mayor Ingrid Lewis Martin, Chief of Staff Camille Joseph Varlick, Deputy Mayor for Housing, Economic Development, and Workforce, Maria Torres Springer, Deputy Mayor for Strategic Initiatives, Anna Almanzar, Chief Counsel Lisa Zornberg, and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, Tiffany Raspberry. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to Mayor Adams. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, I really want to thank uh, Reverend Sharpton. I, I read that. I don't know if you guys saw that up at the main, it was per in, yeah. in, in the, in the uh, Daily News. Uh, he really just laid out uh, when you read how this administration is covered, you think you're living in a different city. <laughs> uh, what we have accomplished in two and a half years, and I, when I first took office, I went back and looked at some of the things they were saying about David Dinkins, you know, coded words, incompetence. You know, uh, we know what that means. Uh, we have turned around this city in two and a half years, two and a half years, uh, first ever, first ever, first ever, first ever. You hear that over and over again. And you you won't think that. But uh, we know what we've, we've done. And, you know, again, hats off to Speaker Adams because it takes a partnership uh, to navigate uh, COVID, navigate 206,000 migrants and asylum seekers, navigate 40% increase in crimes when I became the mayor. Jobs were not here. Tourism was gone. No one was on the subway system. And, you know, we weren't building housing. Uh, two and a half years, uh, Reverend Sharpton laid out a tenth of our successes. You know, announcement today, $26 billion in NYCHA, I mean, $26 billion in housing, $2 billion in this budget. Advocates was asking for a billion a billion, and instead we did uh, $2 billion. W's after W's after W. 94% of those who wanted child care, uh, uh, early child care uh, seats, 94% of them received them. And then when you look at the, we dropped the cost of child care by 90%, from $55 a week to less than $5 a week. Uh, over and over uh, uh, again, uh, we've we've done it, and we're going to continue to do it. But I just thought Reverend Sharpton really laid out a real message of uh, of what our successes are and how those successes have have been depicted. And you know, you know what's interesting, Michael? The first two pages of the Daily News. First two pages. <laughs> we had, you know, yesterday we had some of the most historical things that took place in the city. The Supreme Court ruling, all these other issues. And the first two pages, two pages, was uh, uh, who gets the credit for the victory of the, um, of the budget. I don't care who gets the credit of the bitch victory. You know, do, how the sausages are made is not important. Do people have the vegan sausages to eat is more important to me. <laughs> you know that? So if other people want the credit, New Yorkers want resources and we did it we landed the plane as ingrid said over and over again and so 
But uh, if you haven't read Reverend Sharpton's piece, please. Oh, oh look at you. <laughs> read, 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 read that. <laughs> read that story, because I just think it really touched what many of us have been saying. But uh, speaking of public safety, when I was state senator, I advocated for the uh, decrease in in uh, the speed limits. Uh, met with groups, and we did a whole video around this. I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I've been doing this for a long time, back in my Senate days. And now the speed limit is decreased to 20 miles an hour. So important. Too many reckless drivers out there. We have been zeroing in on them, removing over 40,000 uh, moped dirt bikes and illegal uh, uh, two or three wheelers off our streets. Uh, thousands of ghost cars are off our streets. But another way we can help is by decreasing the speed limit. And in some cases, as low as 10 miles uh, per hour. It's, people are driving too fast. And just dealing with our economy, uh, we have been clear public safety, affordability, make this place livable for working class New Yorkers. And we inherited a real issue in our economy. We had a $7.1 billion budget, budget gap that we were able to close and at the same time bring back over $300 uh, million to some of those important issues when we settled the $112.4 billion uh, budget. Uh, the investments are clear. The idea Maria Torres Springer has been just a superstar on these housing issues and these housing numbers. Uh, I, I don't think we were fully, until we retrospectively look at this, uh, what she has accomplished. And we need the city of yes to pass so we could deal with this 1.4% vacancy we have uh, in the city. Uh, education announcement in the 2023 budget, all of these programs that were sunsetting, uh, we were able to sustain. Uh, you know, hats off to Jock Jihad and the chancellor and his team over there. The investment was clear. And all the advocates have been calling on dealing with uh, children with disabilities, uh, those with uh, uh, different le uh, language barriers. What the chancellor is doing with uh, his new initiative, Dial Inclusive, in a Division of Inclusive and Accessible Learning, it will support the needs of uh, multilingual learners and students with disabilities. People have been advocating this for this for decades, and we are going to do it. And it's going to the money is going to be there with the right coordination. And uh, the we want to remind everyone the Charter Revision Commission is in place. Uh, folks, come out. We have um, Manhattan and Staten Island is coming up, asking people to come out. We know 8.3 million New Yorkers and 35 million opinions. This is an opportunity to hear those uh, opinions. And lastly, we want to fl uh, flag, I, I learned a new term, was it smashing? Smishing. 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 <laughs> Campaign <laughs> attempting to defraud. We probably added new, more new words to Webster <laughs> in the last five years in the history. You know, uh, so our cyber command center is aware of this campaign involving a fake New York City uh, pay website. And so the Department of Finance and City Pay will never request payment from anyone with uh, via text messages. And many of us say it could never happen to me. You'd be surprised how we are looped into uh, these uh, various requests for our personal information. Just be real conscious of that. And we're going to do our job. OTI has created a social media alert which has been disseminated by the Department of Finance communication team to inform residents uh, of this problem. And so why don't we turn it back over to you, uh, Deputy Mayor Fabian uh, Levy, and I hope, you know, seeing that new baby born, giving you a motivation, you know? <laughs> um, I would just point out, I just want to be very clear, this is a scam. Uh, <laughs> so, just want to be clear, this is a scam, so if you see this link, first of all, it has a .com. City agencies don't use .com, but again, like the mayor said, we will never ask you via text message to pay a bill. This is going all over. I've seen it. People from upstate send me uh, messages, even reporters saying they got this. This is one I personally got in the middle of the night last week, so uh, lots of people are getting this. So please just report this out as a scam, not something that anyone should be clicking on. Uh, all right, we'll take some questions, Liz. Mr. Mayor, um, How are you, Marcia? this morning you, your administration um, announced an initiative in Midtown to deal with quality of life issues. I wonder if you could 
discuss with us the quality of life issues that you hope, the conditions that you hope to correct, and address the fact that a lot of people say they're afraid to go there for a host of reasons and what you're trying to accomplish. Did a walk through uh, last week, I think it was Thursday or Friday, with the uh, Times Square uh, theater community, and there were uh, several things that we observed, and uh, I also did a walk through on 34th Street uh, last year uh, with the team. There's a number of things we are facing. Some of them are within our span of control, some of them are not. Uh, you, you know, those who are loitering and dealing with uh, the real drug issue we have, that we have in the, in the, in the city, uh, you know, as you know, uh, those issues uh, take a lot of care. That's what Deputy Mayor William Ison has been really looking at, because you can't just pick someone up because they are nodding because they are, you know, high on narcotics. You just can't arrest them. Uh, so it's a combination of enforcement. In those areas, the crime is down in those precincts. Uh, but we're still dealing with the visual. Uh, we have the Roosevelt Hotel that's there. We had a real problem with scooters uh, that were lining the sidewalk. We had people who was just uh, creating a, just a, in an unsightly condition. It could have been a combination of uh, a tourists uh, a combination of, of those who live in the area. And so we wanted to go in, and I like to get on the ground, and I did a walk. I, I'm communicating with the commissioner, uh, and I'm communicating with Department of Sanitation, DOT. That has to be a combined effort. And I'm a little concerned about the narrowing of 8th Avenue. You know, 8th Avenue has been narrowed down to two lanes, and if someone is double parked, it turns into one lane. And the theater community says this is having a major impact. So we need to we look at what we're doing over there. So it's a combination of things that's happening. Maybe you could tell us what you hope to, what message you're trying to send, not only to tourists, but also commuters who have to come into that area, whether it's the Port Authority bus terminal, um, Times Square. You know, what kind of a message you're trying, and tourism, what kind of a message you're trying to send to people about this area and about how you want to fix it? Yeah, and that's the, that is the heartbeat of our tourist uh, uh, dollar. You know, that is our anchor. Times Square is it. Times Square, we hope to pull people into its gravita gravitational pull and then propel it throughout the entire city. That is our number one draw. If anyone is there 1 a.m., 2 a.m., sometimes I walk the streets. If I am just want to get a real boost, I walk to Times Square around 2 a.m. in the morning, and it's just unbelievable. So we, it must be clean, it must be safe, and we must make sure that um, uh, whomever is in the area is following appropriate rules. And, you know, like I said, it's a challenge because you, you have many outsiders. You have, uh, you, know, you know, the impact of the migrants that's in the area, the hotels. You know, you'd rather put it in a big location than in a smaller community. But it should be clean. What I've learned uh, that the first step to disorder is an unclean um, clean place. And Department of Sanitation has been responding immediately. Uh, and there's more we're going to do. And like I said, the walkthrough helped me a lot because I'm going to speak with the commissioners about having a concerted operation with the Alliance. The Alliance has been a real, a, a real partner on identifying what they believe are the problems. What is, what is the, I'm sorry, the Manhattan police yeah. supposed to do? What is the way? The district attorney is supposed to do. He's part of the initiative. Well, he has a, 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 a role when, you know, particularly when we have repeated offenders in the areas of shoplifting, in the areas of those uh, who are committing uh, crimes in the area. You know, so he, it's, it's a real partnership. We meet with our district attorneys, uh, DM Banks meet with our district attorneys, and we have a coordinated effort to work together. We believe in tearing down the silos and the walls uh, to cooperate with each other. Um, How are you? Good, thanks. Two good. questions. Um, first, I wanted to ask about the budget. Um, I know you've talked a lot about sound fiscal management, bond ratings, you know, the good marks you got there, but um, some of the watchdog groups are already noting that um, overtime costs, you know, for uniformed agencies like the NYPD, it looks like they're under budgeted again, as they have been for years at this point. Um, can you just explain why is it, you know, if it just comes back to bite the city again next year? Why underestimate by hundreds of millions of dollars what you know these uniform agencies are typically spending on overtime? Why not just 
raise that number if it seems like year after year they're vastly exceeding um, what what's budgeted. And then, well, okay. on Wall Street, they have the the um, the bulls in is it the dove? What's the other bear. side? Bear. The bulls in the bear. Uh, um, there's always those who are more aggressive in predictions and more conservative. That is just, you know, there's a reason, there's a term called liberal and conservative. We take a very conservative approach because we can't get it wrong, number one. Number two, we're seeing things that others are not seeing, uh, such as uh, if, if uh, D.M. William Isom didn't come up with a plan of dealing with the migrants and asylum seekers, we would have had 206,000 people in our care. Uh, that is just not predictable. Uh, we're still getting 5,000, uh, roughly 5,000 a month. You know, these are unknowns. These variables are just unknown. We didn't know which way the economy was going. We didn't know what our tax receipts were going to look like. Uh, when you are responsible for making sure you're writing a check that won't bounce, you're, you're seeing things differently. Now, some of the watchdog groups say you should spend less. And then you leave that meeting and walk outside, and there are thousands of people saying you need to spend more. <laughs> you know, this is welcome to New York. And so we made the smart, right decisions. We, we, I mean, when you look at the management of our, uh, the crises we're facing, to start out January 1st, 2022, and say we're going to put savings in place, and now we see the benefit of those savings, because no one thought we were going to be spending $4.9 billion on migrants and asylum seekers. I knew that, you know what, we better be ready for the uncertainty. And because we went in and told the agencies, you have to find efficiencies, like, like households find efficiencies, we were able to now close that $7.1 billion deficit and have $8.2 billion uh, in savings for what the next crisis is, go is going to happen. And this is what Bloomberg did. Many people don't really appreciate what Bloomberg did at the end of his administration. He turned over a fiscally sound city to the previous administration. And we were able to weather COVID and other things because Bloomberg did that. And I'm creating a fiscally sound city uh, so no matter what the uncertainties are, if it's another COVID, if it's another migrants, if it's another this or that, that we can still run as a city. And I, I just think that's the story that is being uh, lost. And so, yes, we're conservative. Jock T. Hyde is conservative. Trust me, even when we go to him and say, Jock, you need to spend money, it's a battle. But he knows we got to weather these uncertainties that running a city this complex. And we did the, this team did the right thing January 1st, 2022. We took a lot of hits. When we started doing pegs in agencies, everyone criticized us, everyone attacked us, but we were focused. And we said, no, we're going to, going to be ready for the uncertainties. And if I can just uh, answer the overtime specifically, the mayor um, uh, made sure that we have an overtime task force that looks at those numbers very regularly across not only the uniform agencies, but all city agencies. And people have put plans in place to reduce overtime. Uh, as the mayor said, what one of the big challenges is the unknown. There have been a record, record number of demonstrations <laughs> this year. Um, in addition, when you think about overtime, you also have to think about it in the context of how many personnel you have. So if you have more vacancies, you have fewer people to do more work. And so it is it is a balance, and it's something that we're, we're looking at very, very closely and very intentionally at the direction of the mayor on a regular basis. Right. That's a great point you, you raise, uh, DM. Uh, the, we had a record number of protests uh, protecting people from everything from tree lightings to the Israeli Day Parade uh, to those having the right to protest uh, to uh, managing our subway system. You know, we had a spike in, in, in January in subway crime. Now sub subway crime is at near record levels. It's so safe in our subway system. And so I'm not going to do anything that's going to impact public safety in the city. We have to be safe. And, you know, having our police officers out there doing the job is crucial. Now, we need more police officers. You know, we need more correction officers. We're, we're at a DM bank tell me all the time that we're at cold red on correction officers. We need more parole officers. We need more school safety agents. And so if you don't have the personnel, as the DM stated, uh, that you have to have people there to fill those slots. And that's 
what we should all be part of is a recruitment campaign to get people to fill these these jobs. We need more lifeguards, you know, and that's why people from West Africa sh should be able to work to become what lifeguards are from Central and South America, you know. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How you know, she's tougher than Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, my questions, I have a few today. Um, now that the budget has been finalized, I was wondering, are the discussions when it comes to Randy Mastro being nominated for Corporation Council starting again, what does that look like? I also wanted to get a clarification from yesterday. You were asked about Biden's performance in the debate and him dropping out. You mentioned letting the Democratic Party choose the way they want to move forward. I want to know what your uh, role is in the Democratic, the National Democratic Party. Are you a super delegate? And do you think Biden should stay on the ballot when it comes to November? And then final question, I believe on Saturday is the deadline to approve or veto the advice and consent bill. You've publicly come out against it. Do you plan to veto it over the weekend? You've been working on the, um, what's the name, the um, Randy? We're moving forward with Mandy. You know, we're working in partnership with the council to see how things can manifest. It hasn't changed. You know, we've been in a good place with them, contrary to what the news has been reporting. We needed to get past the budget cycle. So we'll just move forward and see how things progress with Randy. You know. The uh, the ad advice and consent, uh, the team has been really working really hard on this. I, I, I voice uh, my concern about it. Uh, 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 Lisa and the team has really been digging into the history. There's been just a large number of those who have been in government, I think going back to the Lindsay's days, Lisa, you know, who have talked about this bill. And uh, so we're still in discussion. We make a determination on how we're going to uh, move forward. But you, you will know, we'll make sure we call you over at New York One before <laughs> we do anything and let you know what we're going to do. We'll, we'll call her afterwards. Okay, okay, after, see? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and in the area of President uh, Biden, you know, he started out slow. I think he, he started to move for, forward uh, as he went on. And, you know, listen, I, I identify with him. You know, people want to take the worst day of your life and define your life. I know what the last couple of years have been. There was a reason I said I'm the Biden of Brooklyn, uh, because I just think working class people are authentic. I remember meeting him in 2021. Uh, when I went to the White House, uh, uh, and uh, we were able to chat briefly, and you know, just authentic, authentic leaders are not perfect. Uh, you know, we have good days and we have bad days, and you know, people want to make the worst day of your life um, your your entire life. Uh, but uh, I think it's imperative that he makes a decision on where he's going to move forward with his partners uh, in the party. And whatever I can do, I'm going to do. I'm not going to get ahead of the strategy. I'm going to be in alignment with the strategy. I, I, I'm a super delegate, am I correct? Yes, they changed the name, but it's still super delegate. You know, so I'm a super delegate, and my vote is going to go for um, President, President um, uh, Biden. Mr. Mayor, can you elaborate a little on exactly, just to follow up on Marsha's question, what you hope to do and what you're going to do in, in Midtown? Um, in particular, as it relates to 8th Avenue, fewer pedestrians, fewer bike lanes. Um, and for Ms. Zornberg, you use the term review for what the federal government is doing, for what the Southern District is doing. Can you define that term review and explain why you don't use the term investigation, which everyone else uses? The, the, first of all, whenever you ha you're dealing with an issue, you go first and do an analysis of what the problem is, and then you implement a plan to correct it. And uh, historically, people who are in leadership positions, they would send their people out to do that. I don't do that. I like to go in, do my own visualization, bring in my team, and put a strategy in place. So we're dealing with traffic congestion there. We're dealing with uncleanliness that's in the area. We're dealing with the overuse of mopeds and bikes that are everywhere and, and parked in, in disarray. Uh, we're dealing with the proper movement of people. We're dealing with those who are under the influence of what appears to be uh, drugs uh, that are just loitering in the area. We're dealing with those with severe mental health uh, issues in the area. We're dealing with uh, Mickey and Spider-Man 
not staying in the right area they're supposed to be. Damn. And so, <laughs> Damn, right, right, the cow, right. The, the, you know, I think the, the naked cowboy was out there also. So we need to look at all of that, and then you see the problem, and you come with a strategy to correct it. And that's where we are right now. Friday, I think it was Thursday or Friday, I did a walkthrough, and I had a good team of people with me, and now we're sitting down and we're putting in place the strategy to correct each one of those issues, because it's not a, just a one, one, one size fits all. How do you prevent those folks from just going to other neighborhoods and causing trouble there? Or east or north. You, you have to stay on top of it. It's not about displacing your problem to another area. Uh, you align yourself, because that's a good question, because that often happens. So you align yourself with just not the precinct personnel in that one area. You align the precincts and the borough commander so there's a full plan, because you anticipated the displacement of the problem. You want to make sure you have an effective solution. You do what um, DM Will Isom uh, uh, has done. I don't think people realize she removed 7,000 people off our subway system um, that were dealing with severe mental health issues. We didn't displace it to a, to the Port Authority. No. A thousand of them we gave shelter to. Uh, when you look at what she's doing with scouts, we were on a call yesterday with the police department that's going to do a new initiative. In the next couple of months, you're not going to see these severe mental health people on the system without the care they need. So we don't want to displace the problem to another location. We are going to make sure that we give people the services they need and take corrective actions in the meantime. I know, but I didn't get the answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, uh, Alisa. I don't, I'm not sure I even get the question. It seems like you're trying to just um, well, ask about. I think that's a colloquial term, and I'm I'm not going to get into it. I mean, okay. let's talk about smishing. You know, there. Well, we're talking about smishing. Matt, run, Jeff. Are you saying you're going after the naked cowboy? No. No, no, no. We love them. We love them. We were an investigation. We're going to leave him there. We're going to put him under review. Uh, questions for you. The yes, sir. Is that the um, one behalf of my colleagues, uh, the New York Times and ProPublica uh, recently published an investigation that showed Police Commissioner Caban has been exercising uh, a little known authority he has uh, to end cases of alleged police brutality before they uh, get a chance to uh, have a disciplinary trial. I'm wondering if you are concerned about that practice by the police commissioner. Were you aware of that practice, uh, that it was going on? May, may and then secondly, do you think it jobs with your promise when you were elected to uh, create more transparency in the police department? My second question is on, you talked about coded words when people were referring to you as <laughs> incompetent. Many of your primary opponents have used that, that language. I'm wondering, are you saying that they're calling you incompetent because of race, or maybe there's another reason you think they uh, Lisa, Lisa first, could, yeah. Lisa could answer, but let me just answer his first part. Um, uh, you could determine, uh, I think Reverend Sharpton laid out the case. And it, you, know, you could determine based on what Reverend Sharpton laid out and the history of what he did. I think what he did a good job of laying out. <laughs> and so. Uh, you, then you make the determination of your own. And while, while you're here, I also want to point out that story you guys wrote the other day on, on, on the migrants, migrants in, in uh, education, um, what the Department of Education uh, has done for migrants. And the Department of Education basically did a good job, but City Hall and the, the administration hasn't, hasn't done a good job. The Department of Education is my Department of Education. <laughs> so how do you separate an agency and say the agency did a good job, but the administration did a good job? A principal is under the chancellor. The chancellor is under the mayor. We have got, done a good job of educating 38,000 children. So don't separate the success of the policies that we put in place as, is, as though we have not been the ones who are the architects of those, of those policies. And I'm not getting that. I'm, you, you disconnect us from our success, and then you want to connect us to any problem. It's either one or the other. Either this administration is leading the city and all of the initiatives, and we take the blame where we fail, but when we succeed, don't pull it out from the administration. And when I read that article, it appears as though 
we were in the way of the success of the school system that's educating these 38,000 children. They are doing it with the resources we're giving them. You know, that's what they're, do what they're doing. And that's the pattern that we're talking about um, that, that I think Reverend Sharpton clearly laid out in his article. It's attempting to appeal as peers, though, this administration has not been successful in navigating the crisis with our team over in Albany and our team in, in, the, in the city council. Go ahead, Lisa. You want to talk about the... Yes, uh, I, the I appreciate your question, sir, because it, there's some clarification and some misunderstandings, and I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. So consistent with the law and specifically consistent between a memorandum of understanding that exists between the New York City Police Department and the CCRB, there, there are procedures that permit the police commissioner uh, only in certain cases where there have been police officers against, there have been no previous substantiated allegations. Um, the police officer in those, in those, the police commissioner can retain the case uh, in those circ certain circumstances so that instead of a CCRB trial, it is the police commissioner who determines and adjudicates uh, any discipline. So I just want to be clear, first of all, when, when you said that uh, if, a, if the police commissioner retains a case, that it's the end of the case or it shuts down a case, that's inaccurate. It does not, if the police commissioner decides to retain a case, then under the specific procedures that are consistent with the law and agreed upon, if he retains the case, it does not mean no action is taken. It only means that the police commissioner adjudicates the case instead of a CCRB trial. And the part, the second part of your question was about transparency, so I want to address that too. This process is transparent. So in the instances where the police commissioner determines to retain one of those cases, the police commissioner provides a written explanation to the CCRB giving the why, explaining why the decision was made for the police commissioner to retain the case, and that communication gets posted quarterly on the CCRB's website. And 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 the and the and and and, um, and let's be clear, uh, uh, Jeff, you've been following me for a long time. I have committed my life to police reform and proper policing, public safety and justice. I've said this over and over again. Testified in federal court. Floyd versus in my PD. The federal judge mentioned my testimony in her ruling. Uh, 100 blacks in law enforcement was known to fight against aggressive police behavior. I monitor these cases. I don't interfere, but I'm very clear on what I expect. We are going to have a police department that's professional and public safety. They go together. And police commissioner command, uh, just like Commissioner uh, Tishan Su. Uh, they have been extremely clear in doing that. We're closing the timelines to get these cases uh, uh, handled. They've been going on too long. Uh, so the number of reforms that we're going to do, uh, I think, is going to be uh, admirable and is going to lead the entire country on how you could have both justice and safety. You, you, let Jeff, let Jeff finish. Go ahead, Jeff. Or are you saying all of those cases were people without prior disciplinary actions? Or? I think you should follow up uh, and get specific answers from the PD itself, which is very more, you know, much more familiar. I don't want to misspeak, but what I'm, what I'm telling you is that the retention, the police commissioner's retention ability is limited. And to my knowledge, it is limited to cases where allegations are brought against an officer who's had no prior substantiated allegation made against him or her. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for making it happen, Room 9. I was there yesterday. I think it's, it's just great. And uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, would the mayor travel to Paris for the Olympic Games in 2024? Also, oh, Mayor, it's, it's just unbelievable. We just want to know what's the secret. You always bounce back. Is it the secret? <laughs> I mean, you just, you always, you always bounce back. <laughs> I would, I would love to go to Paris, but when I even leave the city to go to Queens, you know, they write about where is the mayor, you know, they, they, they get really lonely when I'm not here. And so I'm going to do an analysis. Um, the mayor of Paris is a good guy. I think, Camille, you just came back, right? I did. You know, so... Of uh, Camille and I think uh, two of our um, leadership, Dear Man, and Dear Man, they both came back. 
um, participating in an important conference there. And so I'm looking at it uh, because I think uh, we... Yeah, and we we get ready to have two a, a huge event with the you know we won the the finals for the uh, the oh. World Cup, and so it's always good to see what's happening. So I you'll be the first person I let know that I'm going. <laughs> what about the Super? Is it the smoothie or you always bounce back? How do you do it? Oh, well, you know, um, stay focused, no distractions, and grind. You know, that's what you have to do if you allow people. People wake up every day with a mission, how am I going to distract the mayor? And I am so focused that I know how good we're doing, and I see myself through crises. I don't see myself in crises. And just as, you know, people were saying, Yo, you're not going to get the budget passed, you're not going to get the budget passed, what did I kept saying? We're going to land the plane. <laughs> you know that? We got this. Hi, Mayor Adams. Katie. How's it going? I wanted to ask, I think we don't care if we go to Queens, I think it's Southampton's a little bit further than Queens. But I wanted to ask you, uh, my colleague Bill wrote a story about a police officer who was, um, she lied twice about getting the COVID vaccine. And Commissioner Caban, it's his first deviation from the discipline matrix, a rule that she should not lose her job, even though according to the discipline matrix and according to an NYPD administrative trial judge's um, recommendation that she be terminated, she was not. So I just wanted to get your take on... Um, Hold on, get your camera going. No, no, no okay, I have to I'm ask. Wait. It's very specific. You have, uh, yes. What kind of message does it send when an NYPD trial judge recommends an officer lose her job for lying to the IAB, IAB, but then the commissioner deviates both from that recommendation and from the matrix, and then do you believe officers should be terminated for material lies absent extraordinary circumstances, as the matrix currently says? And, uh, and when I saw that, uh, two things I saw in the story. In the story, I believe I saw that uh, other officers were fired for the same thing. That's not true. I immediately called and uh, spoke to DM Banks. I said, what's going on here? And DM Banks made it clear that no one was fired for that type of infraction. And there were uh, extenuating circumstances with this young, young lady, uh, this uh, officer, I should say, and she was given 85 days suspension, 85 days, and one year probation. That is a huge, huge penalty. Um, the commissioner wants to send the right message, but I never want Commissioner Caban and any of my commissioners to be robotic. I want them to be human beings, and I want them to make the right call and make the right decision for the good of the agency and for the good of our city. And so I think he uh, did that analysis based on the totality of the entire uh, operation. And he made the right decision within his powers. He utilized what was within his powers. And so um, he 85 days, one year, no one else has been uh, 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 terminated for that infraction. I think he made the, he made the right decision. Matrix should be changed then if, if commissioner is going to deviate from it? No, I think the commissioner, you know, I don't, again, you never take out the, uh, never take out the human element of making decisions for human beings. I don't want a decision for a human being to be dropped into an AI computer and without saying what's the outcome of it. I want commissioners to be human beings and look at the totality of the decision and make decisions as human beings. And, and he did that. And listen, Caban is a, you know, if you don't know Commissioner Caban, he's, he moves around this city and the amount of love he gets and the amount of respect these officers are give, given to him, they are working for him. I think he needs to keep doing what he's doing. And I said suspension, she lost 85 vacation days. And that's a lot of time, a lot of time. Uh, Mr. Mayor, on Friday... What's uh, happening? I'm, I'm good, Harry. Good, good. <laughs> um, on Friday, after you at the speaker had your handshake, uh, she made remarks, you know, about wanting to move away from the budget approach where cuts are being made and then the council has to fight to restore them. I guess, you know, she made similar remarks last year. Did you feel like those comments resonated with you? Is that something that you want to commit to doing going forward? Yes, yes. Listen, I love uh, uh, Adrian. Uh, Adrian is solid. Uh, I'll always call myself an urban mayor because of my style and methodology. And I think she's an urban speaker. And I don't, I don't know when we can go back and see just, you know, just common folks that are running these major cities. And so, 
if she feels there's a method that we could use to move away from where we were to where we need to go, I'm, I'm all ears. You know, uh, I think Adrian has been a great leader. People want to focus on the three or four things that we disagree on and not, not the 96 things that we agree on. I'm just really proud what the two of us, uh, what we have done. Uh, we've showed everyday public school students that you could arise and manage these cities during difficult times. You know, this was a difficult, this was a difficult time to be the mayor and to be the speaker. And if we want to acknowledge it or not, uh, you know, we brought this city back. And I'm proud of her. And if she has some ideas, I'm open to to hear them. And we don't have to just agree on everything. You know, um, we just need to move the city forward and work for everyday working class people. And Tim, I want to just jump in. I, I want to be clear. It wasn't a. I want to be clear. It wasn't a fight of restoration. We negotiated what needed to be restored. Right. We had um, budget negotiation teams who worked copiously. Jock, Jeremy, and I worked weekly, and sometimes as we got closer to the end of the budget, three times a week, sometimes daily, in order for us to sit down and figure out what could we restore. These were extenuating circumstances, circumstances that we did not anticipate in our wildest imaginings, right. and we were able to successfully work with the council in order to restore needed and vital services. And we're proud of the fact that libraries, culturals were baseline. These are things that the libraries and the culturals had asked for for many, many, many administrations. And this administration was able to deliver it. And it would have been undeliverable without our direct involvement. The city council would not have been able to be successful. It is a partnership. So they, the they did not they push for the restorations. We worked, no, we worked in partnership. We worked in partnership 100% of the way. So it's a matter of perspective. To them, they pushed for those restorations. We wanted the same restorations. <laughs> but again, we did not know what laid ahead. Right. Okay, we had a tremendous budgetary crises with the migrants. And we were able to put that aside and work in partnership to get to a successful budget. And it was a success. Yeah, and you know, I think that what you raise, Ingrid, is so important to me because you don't realize how much uh, Tiffany, Ingrid, uh, DM, uh, uh, Isom, uh, uh, all of us, uh, Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer was constantly pushing, we got to put this extra $2 billion in, in housing. Uh, First Deputy Mayor Wright was saying, we got to look at these libraries and figure out how to get this done. So all the noise out there, didn't know what was going on internally. You know, there's no comfort that, that any of these folks that are up here in these leadership positions with their portfolios uh, want to see uh, the child care. Ch Commissioner Bank, I mean, Chancellor Banks was fighting hard to say, how do we get this done in Land the Plain? And so we weren't loud, but when you look at the $7.1 billion in savings and only 300 and I think 44 45 or 49 million, we, we sat down and said, okay, here's what we all could agree on to uh, put back in. You know, so uh, it, it doesn't matter to us who has, who has the credit. What matters to us is that every child that wanted access to a seat is going to have that. Um, our library is open seven days. Our, our cultural institution, go speak to those culturals and tell them about, ask them about the conversation they had with me. And I said, just hold on. We're going to get through this. You know, so Ingrid, you're, you're dead right. We were there. We just need to figure out how to get it done. The new me. Right, and the, the new, new right. hospital, the, the, the trauma center. Exactly, the trauma center uh, out in the Rockaways. And so, you know, we're going to always be the bad guys. We got that. And we know that's the price of leadership. Uh, but no matter what we say, the turbulence will not define the pilot. The pilot is defined by his ability to get to the gate and land the plane. And we land the plane, baby. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Um, Mr. Mayor, I would like to get a reaction to the um, accident in Deer Park where the NYPD officer died. Mm. And we are Renhak, a uh, family named Kovacic. She was actually Polish. If mm. I can get your comment, uh, are you going to attend the funeral? Uh, uh, y yes, and I, I spoke with her, her husband. Uh, he was devastated. You could only imagine uh, and this, uh, the 
the culprit allegedly drank uh, many uh, beers, uh, you know, to have uh, someone uh, at the prime of their life, uh, a law enforcement officer who probably responded to many scenes of violence. Uh, you never thought you'll be making a notification or someone will be, will be making a notification to your family members. It's just a devastating story and just reinforces as we move into the July 4th weekend how drinking and driving is a terrible combination. And I did not know she was from the Polish community, a community that is just, you know, I've known so long through my days in the 9 4th. And I think I was the first mayor to ever march in a Polish state parade. Um, you know, the Polish community is a real contributor to our, our city. Uh, and uh, my heart goes out to the family. And, you know, I already told uh, Gladys uh, and the team I would like to be at the funeral and I, I would like to show my, my support. But it's, it was a devastating notification. It took a while before we were, we knew because uh, I believe she didn't have her ID. Uh, but when we were notified, uh, it, it shook us. It shook us all. And we also lost a correction officer who uh, died um, for appeared to be a medical condition. Uh, com the commissioner notified me the other day. Um, his funeral was coming up uh, as well. You know. You know. Anytime you lose a loved one, uh, it. It, um, uh, it 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 impacts um, it impacts us all. Uh, but when you lose a member of the uh, civil servant family, uh, it has a major impact. And we have we've had a couple of losses, you know, throughout uh, the last two and a half years. And you know, so it really hurts. Uh, not only uh, uh, we lost a total of four people, I think, in that in that incident. And um, just, you know, having a car drive through the window and while you're sitting there just, you know, doing something that you probably do every week. And from my understanding, uh, the it was learned, you know, when it first happened, uh, her husband found out about it, uh, you know, through just wondering where she was. But it's just a devastating, devastating story. And the criminal justice system would would, would take its course. And then Ingrid just uh, to, uh, notified me that today we lost the sanitation chief. The funeral is today. The funeral is, is today. And, um, and so, you know, these incidents impact you, you know. It, it really impacts. And I'm really sorry for, for the loss of that family. Hi, Mayor. Hard pivot, but to something I know you want yes. to talk about, affordable housing, which you celebrated this morning. Uh, yes. Specifically, the intersection of affordable housing and office conversion, kind of a, a separate but related initiative that you champion. We've seen some big office conversions. You visited down on Water Street. Uh, they just announced the Pfizer building was being converted right by our studio's 1,500 uh, uh, units. But you're not seeing a lot of that become affordable. So looking at this $2 billion how do you make sure it actually results in affordable housing somewhat quickly for families in need? She's chopping at the bit right now <laughs> because she, she just loved Love talking topic. about this topic. So why don't we turn it over to uh, Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for the question, Henry. So we've been focused on this from day one. We did an analysis early on the administration together with the city council that there's about 135 million square feet of outdated office space that could be converted. And the potential of that conversion is about 20,000 homes. So that's a lot, right? Um, so then we did a, a number of, took a number of major steps to make sure that it happened. That includes, of course, through the city of Yes for housing opportunity, taking care of the regulatory issues. And then to your point, um, fighting really hard to make sure that we get an incentive um, in Albany as part of that housing package, where, by the way, we got the four major things on housing that we, we had um, really fought for, so that as um, the incentive is used, you must build affordable as part of that project. Then we put together an office accelerator um, in order to ensure that as buildings are contemplating this, that they had a way to get the type of service and, um, and support because of the often labyrinth of um, city uh, agencies that have to be involved in the conversion. There are about seven, 70 buildings that are part of that program, and many of those buildings have converted. So it's really been a multi-pronged approach so that the 135 million square feet, there's a real chance they get converted into 20,000 homes, and it's really through 
um, the incentive um, that we are already marketing and making sure that the development community knows about where we're going to get um, the affordable and a significant number of affordable um, in each of those buildings because we want to learn the lessons from Lower Manhattan as those conversions happened and th they were great but not enough affordable. So we're not going to redo that mistake and we're gonna make sure that as many of those 20,000 units are available to New Yorkers across the income spectrum. Is there a conversation around shifting to more of a mandate model than an incentive model because affordable housing is so desperately needed? Well, we have to, you are mandated if you use that incentive to create affordable. And um, we're going to use every other tool that we have, including the $2 billion that we have added to the budget so that it's a now a historic $26 billion a budget for affordable um, and many others um, because converting um, offices to residential, it's, they're difficult. It's difficult financially, it's difficult from a regulatory perspective, but we have painstakingly identified all of the barriers. We have solutions for each and every one of them. And the fact that these major buildings are converting, I think is proof that we're, we're making progress faster than many other cities who are um, experiencing these issues. Liz. Liz. Oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to ask you about the 1,600 families that are on the pre-K waiting list. I know as part of the budget deal that you reached with the council, the agreement was that the city would go through that entire list and ensure that there was a seat for every single uh, student. I wanted to know um, how fast, you, like when can families start expecting to get offers? And then secondly, on the comment to Jeff about how you've devoted your life to police reform, I wanted to ask if you could talk about what you consider the major police accountability reform you've instituted as mayor in terms of transparency or addressing racism in the force. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a, com a, a combination. of uh, One of the big things that I don't think many people appreciate about this is that rarely has a mayor understood the intricacies of not only policing but agencies. You know, if you were to do an analysis of the uh, previous mayors throughout the decades, uh, they have they did not come from that agency that has a major impact on. Uh, our quality of life. That's one of the m one of the most emotional agencies in our city, the New York City Police Department. So it's a combination of things, not only symbolic, but substantive. We are moving to close the gap of how long it takes to identify those officers who are not suitable to do offices. It was taking years, and that was one of the major things that I wanted to focus on uh, to uh, ensure that we identify those officers who commit crimes or do something that's improper and how long they're going to stay in the, in the agencies. Uh, the second is the proper use of stop and frisk. Um, you know, stop and frisk has been something that has been abused throughout the years, going in, doing a real analysis um, on how we are utilizing a tool that if effectively used, that we could address the issues. Uh, the third is our inspection team, something that you don't see, don't even know that exists. We beefed up our inspection team to be proactive, to go out there and identify those cops that are not following the rules, not doing the right things. Uh, the amount of manpower we've put in place by those inspection teams uh, that could identify misbehavior, uh, inactions, the failure uh, to properly uh, carry out their police roles is something that's crucial. And one of the most important things I could do around reform was uh, the commissioners I picked, uh, particularly Commissioner Caban. Long history, everyone knows his history. His dad fought for uh, integration in, in the police department, and now his son is the commissioner of it. The right leadership can place us in the right direction. And so those uh, stricter timelines on cases that have languished for months is a huge shift in what we have done uh, in, in, the, in the past. And then the best reform we could have is people being safe. You know, because the loudest may talk about disbanding, defunding, removing police department, but that's not what I hear from New Yorkers. Uh, having police officers respond courteously, 
um, professionally and respectfully to the people in the city that they have and driving down crime, that is a huge reform for me. Far too long, for eight years, officers did not go after these quality of life issues. Uh, they ignored those who refused to pay their fare in the subway system. They ignored those who were driving ghost cars on our streets. They ignored those uh, who were uh, doing these petty uh, crimes, these quality of life crimes. That's part of the reform that many of us don't realize. I need to reform a police department that say taxpayers are paying you well, gave you a great contract. Now it's time to make sure that we front and center to keep the people of this city safe. Mm -hmm. on the, for, oh. Sorry, on the education question, did you want to say I that? I got it. Yes. Sorry. Thanks, Camille. Um, well, and the mayor mentioned this in his remark at the beginning, that about 94% um, of those um, families who apply for 3K um, receive an offer, right, in one of the top offers. And you speak about the numbers of families who have not received an offer. It was initially, when the process started, it was 2,400. As of now, 1,000 um, <laughs> seats have been filled for those families who are able to access those seats. We have about 1,400 left, and we are still working as families accept and reject some of the seats. We are working with the Department of Education and the team internally here at City Hall to make sure that those offers go out as soon as possible and as quick as possible to make sure those 1,400 fam families or so receive those seats by before the end of the year. Any second before, before the start of the school year, right? Before the start of, of the school, school year, year, correct. And uh, in the historical investment that was announced last week, along with city council regarding not only 3K, but the entire system and how us together with the Department of Education and city council are gonna work not only to make sure the investments are put in the right places, but also that the work that's needed to be done in order to reimagine the system <laughs> is done in conjunction with city council. We continue working both um, here with city, city hall and city council, as well as our partners at ECE, at the Department of Education, our partners at school, school, Office of Student Enrollment, as well as um, the announcement that was made last week, I believe on Monday, about uh, Christina Foti, the Deputy Chancellor, who's gonna work particularly with our um, early childhood education department for those students with special needs. And I think it's important to note that in 2019, 67% of families got their first choice. And in 2024, I think we had, what, four times more people applied? Four. 94% of people got their first choice. Did, did, you, did you get that? So that, that's an, <laughs> those, those are important facts. So the, the team you know, has done a great job. Right. And in 2019, we had 14,000 people applied. 2024, we've had 42,000. So not only did we go out there and say to parents, this is something you should be doing for your children, we increased right. the numbers and we increased the availability. And if, if there's nothing you take away from what we've done, previously we had a bunch of seats with no people in the seats and taxpayers were paying for those empty seats. And I said, we're not doing that anymore. These are taxpayers' dollars. We should not be wasting taxpayers' dollars. So we are realigning. We're using um, the uh, OTI, uh, a CTO, to use technology to identify where the, where is that person who needs the seat and where is the seat. We, we, we had this fake program that was going on, and we're drilling down and make it right using taxpayers' dollars. 94% of the people who applied for the seats on time got their, the choices that they want. That's, I mean, what more can we say? Uh, How are you? Why are you calling him? I like to call on him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> life got shortage, it looks like most of the youth learn to swim programs are not gonna be offered. I think there's one pool in Manhattan that's offering public swimming programs. Last year, uh, the city council passed uh, a program. I think they allocated 5.4 million, so all public school second graders could could get into a swimming program. Um, it was knocked out in the November budget cuts. Um, is it back in this year uh, coming up for the second grade swim program? And if it's not in, why not? And if it is in. Where are these kids going to swim? Because it's a school year program, and it have to be swimming in indoor pools. 
You know, uh, 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 Mira, do you know about? Uh, Mira is not here, but I do. Oh, okay, Mira. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm, we can look into it and yeah, get back. Yeah, to we're, for, we're, we're fine out. I don't know the budget lines off the top of my head. Yeah, but uh, we're fine out. We we'll get that question for you, answer for you. But we have 600 lifeguards, more than we had last time at this time of the year. There is a national lifeguard shortage, national. And that is why everyone mocked me, but when I say that we have those from West Africa, South America, Central America, who are willing to, willing to work, uh, we should look at that. Instead of keeping our pools closed and the aspiration of people closed, let's open the doors, let's open our pools, let's allow our new arrivals who can pass the a test. Let's give them the right to participate as lifeguards, as food service workers, as backstretch workers in the racing industry, as nurses. We people need to work. It makes no sense that we have jobs that are available, could be filled, and we're not allowing employees to fill them. Congestion pricing is gone. Do you have any idea if it would, if you'd like to see it come back, maybe with a little more exemptions for first responders, uh, maybe a slightly lower fare? Do you have any leading one way or the other on it? Yeah, uh, uh, the best idea I, I have is to support the governor as she navigate us through uh, how to get this done right. I've always said we had to get it right. I was very big on exemptions for working class people, such as MTA workers. Uh, you know, I've been very clear that MTA workers uh, should be a part of that conversation, conversation of exemptions, and we just have to get it right. We have to have the right amount, uh, the right methodology, because I don't want to do anything that's going to turn around our economy. We're moving in the right direction. Uh, this economy is uh, starting to boom. I don't want to do anything that's going to impact my restaurant industry, impact my tourism. Uh, we, we want to do the balance, and as Ingrid has always point, pointed out, I don't want to dis displace the carbon emissions uh, to places like Staten Island, to places like the Bronx and others. We just got to get it right, and, and that is what's important to me. And uh, Keith, just I found out uh, Learn to Swim is back this year. Uh, free classes will be available in all five boroughs for kids ages one and a half to 17. Sessions run between July 8th and August 30th, and you can register online on the park's website. All right, give us a, give us a long one. Oh, easy, 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 easy. Easy, yeah, 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 easy, easy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Listen. Listen. Let's go. Mike, Mike. Easy, easy. Go ahead, Mike. Mike. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Yes. What about uh, the NATO from the New York Times? Go, we go, we go, we go, we go get this breathe. 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 How do you explain that, given it was widely publicized in 2021, <coughs> that the paper he worked for um, was forced to register as a foreign agent? Uh, listen, I know Robin. Uh, we I knew him from uh, you know from the days of Borough Hall, um, and um, I had no knowledge um, that he registered and as a foreign. Uh, we say foreign lobbyist. Uh, okay, I, I had no, I, no, no idea. And when people registered under that, it doesn't mean you can't speak with them. It, can't, it doesn't mean that you can't do interviews with their paper. Um, there are rules that they must, they must follow. Uh, he has participated on a number of things that we've done in, in Borough Hall. Uh, but, you know, it's all about following the rules. Um, hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Thanks for addressing our question. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to uh, go back to the Venezuelan gangs and just yes. clarify, is there going to be a review of security in migrant um, shelters citywide? Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up question, um, this is separate. State Assembly uh, woman Raj Kumar has been um, pretty present at a lot of the press conferences lately. Mm -hmm. um, is this uh, an indication that you're going to back her for Comptroller? Well, uh, um, I'm surprised you said that presently she has been there. Uh, as, as, if you go back to the beginning of the administration, my, my campaign, she was it right. I think she was, she was the she first. Was the first um, assembly member to endorse you in the New York State Assembly. Right. Your campaign. You know, and so uh, 
she has clearly sought a vision of this administration, and she has been an advocate based on our real belief on leaning into working class people. You know, uh, she often talks a narrative of how her mother was born in a mud hut in India. And now her daughter was the first woman to be elected to the state from uh, East Indian. Uh, in the case of Bawali, right? Right. And, you know, I know there's a lot of anticipation anticipation on her next uh, next steps, but I haven't heard her make an announcement. Um, but um, she, she assisted us on Diwali to get the Diwali bill. She was the leading voice around uh, the Smoke Act, Out Act. I think she, you know, comes from the cloth of working hard like I have. And people used to criticize me when I was a state senator. I used to be all over the place. Senators used to say, what are you doing in my senatorial district? Because I said crime doesn't stop at a border. And so she has clearly embraced working hard. And I think we should lift up those electors who believe in working hard. She is one of the, uh, uh, the omnipresence, her desire to work. And there's nothing wrong with good old fashioned working hard. And so she's always been at our events. She's always been standing uh, uh, with this administration. And I think uh, her, Assemblyman Gibbs, uh, and a few others, um, they just have been real partners to help us push through our important legislation. And she makes the, the decision that she's going to do something else in her political career, or she's going to go and utilize her, her law degree in practice, or, you know, it's up to her. Uh, but right now, she's been a great, great ally and a great partner. Did you see the majority um, in migrant shelters? Yeah, uh, I spoke with um, uh, 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 Tim Pearson, and um, who has been really um, partnering with uh, the chief of staff to look at what do we need to do in addition, uh, if there's anything at all. Uh, we're big on stopping the weapons from coming in. As I said yesterday, uh, I had uh, Commissioner Weiner and First Deputy Commissioner Kinsella go to Columbia uh, to speak with the Colombian officials to learn about this gang. and to get as much intel as possible. Matter of fact, she, she sent me a briefing uh, this morning. Uh, these are bad guys. These are bad guys. And we must prevent them from having a foothold in our city and not only a Band-Aid of stopping them from bringing weapons inside our herks or shelters, as some of you may call it, uh, but to identify them uh, and send the right message uh, that you're not going to wreak havoc uh, on our streets. And they, they did a good job of learning this this gang uh, and, you know, some of the, their practices. Uh, but like I said, you know, these are bad guys and they do not represent the migrants and asylum seeker community here. You know, this is a small number of people who are, who are violent and we're going to identify them and use our practices like we use with any gang in the city because they're gangs in the city. You know, we just do a good job of identifying them and making sure they do not take a foothold in our city like in other areas. Do you have any interviews of security and migrant shelters? We do this every single week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you.